Welcome to Of the Deep, and thank you all for coming to the Museum of the Moving Image. Today's program is part of our ongoing Science on Screen series, in which we explore everything from seahorses to robots, bringing scientists and filmmakers to the museum. Science on Screen is, an, is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation is a nonprofit philanthropy founded in 1934 that makes grants in research and broad-based education in science, technology, and economics. My name is Sonia Epstein. I'm the curator of this series here, and I run the museum's website, Sloan Science and Film. I am very excited to share with you today films that were shot between 1927 and 34 by ecologist William Beebe's team, the Department of Tropical Research. Beebe is best known as a scientist for his record-setting deep-sea dives in a steel-walled submersible called the Bathysphere, descending 3,028 feet under sea in Bermuda in 1934. He broke all previous records. In addition to being a scientist, Beebe was a great writer and was devoted to enhancing public understanding of science. In his 1934 book, Half Mile Down, he wrote, I shall never experience such a feeling of complete isolation from the surface of the planet Earth as when I first dangled in a hollow pea on a swaying cobweb a quarter of a mile below the deck of a ship rolling in mid-ocean. So in the footage that you'll be seeing shortly, you might uh, empathize with or remember uh, the way that BB likens the bathysphere to a pea swaying in cobwebs. Uh, the bathysphere itself was only four feet nine inches across, and BB was crouched inside of there, often not alone, but with Otis Barton, who uh, engineered the bathysphere. The submersible itself weighed 5,400 pounds. At its greatest depth, it had to withstand pressures of um, up to six and a half million pounds. I will uh, just briefly read to you Bibi's narration of one of their descents, because inside of the bathysphere there was a telephone that was then manned on deck by one, by one of Bibi's uh, research associates. In the case of the films, you'll see that it was uh, Gloria Hollister. So Bibi writes that beginning at 60 feet, they reported from the bathysphere, we are, we are at our deepest helmet dive. At 285 feet, the Lusitania is resting at this level. At 383 feet, we are passing the deepest submarine record. At 525 feet, a diver in an armored suit descended this far into a Bavarian lake, the deepest point at which a human has ever reached. Only dead men have sunk below this, they said at 600 feet. At 1,400 feet, one quarter of a mile down, they remarked, we are still alive. I'll continue. Ever since the beginnings of human history, thousands upon thousands of human beings had reached the depth at which we were now suspended and had passed on to lower levels. But all of these were dead, drowned victims of war, tempest, or other acts of God. We were the first living men to look out at the strange illumination, and it was stranger than any imagination could have conceived. So the film program today combines footage taken on expeditions that BB led to Haiti in 1927 and to Bermuda between 1930 and 34. One of BB's crew members on the Haiti expeditions was a 27-year-old Floyd Crosby, who got his first experience with a movie camera there, and the footage that you'll see underwater at the beginning of the films was taken by him. Some of you might be familiar with Floyd Crosby's name from his later award-winning films High Noon with Gary Cooper or Taboo, which was directed by Robert Flaherty. If you came uh, earlier and you saw the lantern slides, those were accompanied by songs uh, by Floyd Crosby's son, David Crosby of Crosby, Stills and Nash. So the films that we'll see today will be accompanied by uh, High Water uh, on music. They'll be playing uh, saxophone and vibraphone among other instruments. We are very lucky that we have a number of special guests here with us today who I just want to mention. Uh, John Forrest Dolan will introduce the films. John is a vice president of the Wildlife Conservation Society, and he is the director of the New York Aquarium in Coney Island, where BB's bathysphere is actually on view. So I encourage all of you uh, to go and see it. It's a very fun trip. It's kind of insane to just see the actual bathysphere uh, sitting there. You can see the size of it. Um, it's really remarkable. And they have great exhibitions of uh, sharks and sea lions and coral that um, are also a fun trip. So um, John oversees the care and exhibition of all of the aquarium's animals and its conservation programs. 
We are very lucky to also have here with us Howard Rosenbaum, who's the director of the Wildlife Conservation Society's Ocean Giants program. He's a senior scientist at the American Museum of Natural History, and his research focuses on marine uh, mammals, including large whale and dolphin species. I'm thrilled to say that we also have Fabian Cousteau joining us. Fabian is an oceanographic explorer, educator, conservationist, and filmmaker. Many of you might be familiar with the pioneering work of his grandfather, Jacques Cousteau. William Beebe is sometimes referred to as the Jacques Cousteau of his time. Beebe was about 30 years older. Fabian has filmed marine animals underwater, where he also lived for 31 days, breaking a world record. So I urge all of you to stick around after the film screening for the discussion with Fabian and Howard. And I also, just before we begin, want to quickly acknowledge uh, Constance Carter, who is here with us in the audience. She was able to join us uh, from DC, and it's very special because Constance actually worked for William Beebe. She was on his uh, research station in Trinidad in 1959 and 60. Among the work that she did, studying butterflies and fiddler crabs, she helped to rear 800 caterpillars for observation, photography, drawing, and general study. Lastly, I just want to mention that these films come from the Wildlife Conservation Society archives at the Bronx Zoo, where they have 3,000 reels of film footage, which they are just beginning to catalog. Um, I want to thank the Wildlife Conservation Society for allowing us to show these films, and specifically uh, Maddie Thompson, the archivist there, who uh, has been so helpful and so generous with her time. I wouldn't have known about this footage at all if it weren't for a wonderful exhibition that was at the Drawing Center last year, which maybe some of you saw, that Maddie curated along with Mark Dion and Catherine McLeod, a historian who is here today and who has taught me so much about this history. So I'd like to uh, welcome up John Dolan now to introduce the films. Thank you, guys. All right, well, this is exciting. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, and thanks, all of you, for coming out today to see this footage, which is near and dear to my heart. And uh, Bibi is a particular inspiration of mine at the aquarium. As Sonia said, we do have the bathysphere out on exhibit. Um, it sits in front of the aquarium. It's kind of like having the Apollo space capsule in front of your house. It's, it's that amazing and that filled with history. So what I hope to do right now is to just give you a little bit of context about um, the organization that William Beebe worked for and in, um, a little bit about our history, a little bit about the way it fits into how we have uh, evolved as an organization and how key he was to all of that, and then uh, touch a little bit on specifically the bathysphere dives and Beebe himself. So the Wildlife Conservation Society was started as the New York Zoological Society in 1895. And it was started by a number of New York luminaries, uh, including some names you might recognize, like Teddy Roosevelt. And it was um, the first director of the, wildlife, of the New York Zoological Society was a man named William Hornaday. And in 1902, the New York Aquarium joined the family, and the first director there was uh, Charles Townsend. Both of these gentlemen are worth mentioning because uh, they, along with Beebe, were really key to setting the tone for what we do, which is to think about the science of understanding animals in the environment, but think about how do we tell those stories so that we can build public advocacy and public support for preserving and protecting that. So uh, both Hornaday and Townsend were giants of their time in terms of these conservation stories, but it was really William Beebe who defined what that could look like. William Beebe was, at, was the original curator of ornithology at the New York Zoological Society. And he um, started out by going out and doing what people did back then, which were basically going and collecting live animals for exhibit. So he went out on expeditions, and as the curator of ornithology, he focused his expeditions on birds, of course. And he did several notable uh, expeditions to collect pheasants, and he wrote some incredible scientific documents about pheasants and pheasant families and the genetics of pheasants. But more than anything else, what he did was he wrote popular books following those scientific monographs. Because what is the point of science if we're not using that tool to further something in defense of what we love and what we discover? 
And Beebe was really the first one. As Sonia said, he was a fantastic writer. And he became something of a New York celebrity. He was sort of a bon vivant. He was an amazing individual uh, from the standpoint of being very broad based in his interests and in his abilities. So uh, the one thing that we should say about uh, Beebe is that his enthusiasm and his imagination were boundless. The man was unstoppable. So here, we, here he is, the curator of ornithology. He would go out on these collecting expeditions. Of course, all these expeditions start with a boat ride somewhere, right? You've got to get on board a ship to get to South Asia or wherever it is you're going. And rather than sit on the ship waiting to arrive somewhere, Bibi, endlessly fascinated with the world, actually started collecting from the water while they were going. And he was incredibly frustrated by the fact he invented, and <laughs> there is footage that shows this. I don't think we'll be seeing any of it today, but he would hang off of little trapezes as they went over the Sargasso Sea and try to scoop up things to study. And he was frustrated by the fact that his study of the water was always limited to that surface or just below the surface. So when Otis Barton came to him in the late 20s and said, hey, listen, I got this idea. I want to create a cast iron ball, and I want to get in it, and I want to drop down to it. William Beebe said, sure, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and these guys were, I, I, mean, I cannot um, emphasize enough how insane this is. If you go to the New York Aquarium and you take a look at the actual bathysphere itself, which does sit there, and remember that both Beebe and Barton were about six feet tall, and the interior of this ball is about four feet in diameter. They would both cram in there. And I should point out that Barton was also um, subject to motion sickness. <laughs> so th this thing would go out and start swaying before they dropped in the water. And uh, because they had a radio link, you could, uh, there are a number of recordings of, of BB saying, damn it, Otis, not again. <laughs> so on top of everything else, that's how they would begin the voyage. But then they would drop down, and they went through a series on after, uh, coming out of Bermuda. They went on a series of these dives deeper and deeper and deeper. And I should point out that, that beyond popularizing science, beyond being this sort of fearless explorer, Beebe was also an amazing collaborator. Because what he was doing was actually, it, it's hard to, we, there was no photographic or video or motion picture technology that could meet what he was doing at that time. So in order to record what he was seeing down there, he had a telephone link up to the deck. And this meant his incredible powers of description would describe life forms that, mind you, had never been seen before in their natural state. And he would describe them so accurately and so carefully over this link up and they would be the notes would be transcribed up on the deck and an illustrator would be working off of those notes. And when BB got back up from these expeditions and he would sit down with the illustrator and fine tune those, but they came up with a whole series of illustrations of life that had never been seen before. And in fact, if you know anything about the abysmal life forms, the bathyspheric life, you know these animals are weird beyond the imagining even now. And you can imagine what people thought when they saw those. Uh, people accused Beebe of making this stuff up. Of course, his vindication was 30 years later when technology caught up and the Alvin and other deep dives started going on and the videography had caught up, the technology had caught up, and we got real footage of these animals. And sure enough, they look exactly like, like what Beebe carefully described and was carefully illustrated by Elsie Bostelman and others. So uh, Sonia mentioned the, the record-setting dives half mile down, if you can imagine, half mile down. But here's another thing, and this, uh, I, I think it's only a slight exaggeration to compare these dives in the bathysphere into unknown places to the same sort of mesmerizing public aspect that the Apollo space landings had on people. Where were you when you heard this? BB had a telephone link up to the CBS radio network, and he actually broadcast live these dives to a completely enthralled audience. And it's an amazing thing, because you can, you can think about how these dives did one thing, and these dives did a great deal for science. 
But between the book A Half Mile Down and these live radio broadcasts, they did so much more for building this next generation of ocean advocates and ocean enthusiasts, the people that then went on to follow Jacques Cousteau, the people that then went on to work in this area and help protect it. And that's what the Wildlife Conservation Society has done ever since. When Beebe was heading out on his, on his expeditions on a ship called the Arcturus, as he was leaving New York, he went over an area that he called the Hudson Gorge. Today we know that it's the Hudson Canyon. It's a submarine canyon that was carved by the Hudson River in the last ice age, and it cuts through the continental shelf at a depth that rivals the Grand Canyon. And I can't emphasize to you enough how huge this is. It is the largest submarine canyon on the entire East Coast. It's right off our shore. It's part of New York's waters. And it's a place that the Wildlife Conservation Society is proud to have worked to move into nomination as a National Marine Sanctuary, which would be the first National Marine Sanctuary in this area. We're working to understand both the ecology and the economic benefit of this place. And in fact, it's featured, and I'm going to make a shameless shill for the New York Aquarium right now. It is a core feature of a $150 million exhibit that we are going to open in June called Ocean Wonders that is all about shark conservation, but going forward from there into introducing and inspiring New Yorkers about their own water, including the Hudson Canyon. So in some ways, I feel like what BB set, the tone that BB set, and the fearlessness with which he pushed this is, the same, is what we have inherited and the same thing that we try to do today. So the one thing I'm going to add to all of this about BB, if it wasn't enough, is that um, in the terminology of, the time, of our time, Beebe was woke. <laughs> he was a consistent, strong, and steady mentor of women in science when, at a time when that just was not done. And the, wildlife con the New York Zoological Society and the Wildlife Conservation Society since have been the beneficiaries of a very strong history of having women engaged in our work and lead our science. And I'm, you know, he worked so hard in popularizing science. And I'm going to read a quote from somebody, if you will indulge me here. This is a direct quote. So in addition to work, in addition to working on the social behavior of butterflies and fiddler crabs, I helped BB with his correspondence. He received mail from some of the more famous scientists of the day. And while I'd be so eager to reply to Ernest Meyer or George Gaylord Simpson, BB would push their letters to the back of the pile. Instead, he wanted to answer the letters of young people. He would give them observations to make and experiments to do and invite them to write back. He wanted to invest in the next generation of scientists. Now, the woman that wrote that is Constance Carter, who is here with us today. And I want to tell you one thing that uh, Constance told me before we started here today, which is BB is back, apparently. He is pop more popular than ever. There are numerous books being written about his work. And, uh, and I think Constance was one of those scientists at the Department of Tropical Research, one of the women who benefited from working closely with William Beebe, and one of that next generation of scientists that pushed this forward in her 40 years. Was that 40 years? 52. 52 years at the uh, Library of Congress. So, and I would also say that uh, Constance has a lot of stories to tell, so after this, please find her and get talking with her because she will bend your ear about fascinating stuff. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, present to you the footage from the Wildlife Conservation Society archives of the Department of Tropical Research and the great William Beebe. So I guess uh, my first question would be, um, would you ever want to go into the bathosphere? <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some of the audience may think I'm crazy, but I'd say absolutely without a doubt for historic reasons as well as just for the, the thrill of the experience. 
All right. Um, I'm and sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Did you all hear my answer? I, don't <laughs> I wasn't speaking into the yes. microphone. So that was a yes. Um, <laughs> and and did uh, so did did your grandfather did Jacques Cousteau ever speak with you about BB that you remember or my yeah. grandfather spoke about a, a lot of uh, pioneers in that era and BB was certainly at the top of the list because essentially what you're doing is crazy uh, going into an iron ball tethered by a few strands and uh, going into the unknown but that's what makes things happen. And so between, uh, between the two, uh, you saw that uh, it wasn't the most comfortable spot. Uh, it, it certainly was, uh, raised a lot of questions. Uh, I love the pressure testing, by the way. That, that was quite interesting. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, obviously, the results were very positive, And that's what led into a whole new foray of underwater exploration, especially for science. Um, so part of what we saw, Howard, I want to ask you um, in terms of uh, the the role of the field station in marine research. We saw that uh, in these films, the Department of Tropical Research was operating out of field stations in Haiti and Bermuda. Um, maybe you could talk about the role of the uh, marine research station uh, as it existed then and then maybe as it exists today. So first, I want to thank the, the museum for hosting this fantastic event and thank you, you all for coming out. And... Um, that those those images and films were just you know truly awe-inspiring but also i'm thankful that the organisms wow. that i study come to the surface <laughs> having watched those i mean i enjoy diving but uh very much so but uh certainly gave me a new appreciation for um you know for pioneering research um you know the the early days of doing field work in the field you know of marine biology and marine conservation I mean, it, it's 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 very similar, you know, and, and in fact, you know, BB along that continuum. I mean, really, you know, people went and traversed far places, often having long journeys on ships, um, working in not the easiest conditions, um, you know, to really um, to to really embark on, you know, in essence, what was true discovery um, at the time, um, and and really describing. And bringing back, as jo as John mentioned his own in his own remarks, um, to sh illustrate to people about you know the the remarkable nature of the natural world, um, and and through time you know that has um, continued as a, as a marine conservation biologist, um, we still do that. It's it's actually changed um, it, it remarkably. I would say, I, I felt like in my in the history of my own career. Um, you know, I, I had the fortune and, the, and especially to, to set up in some of these remote places like off the coast of Madagascar or off the coast of Gabon or off the coast of Colombia or the coast of Western Australia, work to set up some of these remote field stations that had where we set up, you know, on uninhabited islands. Um, worked in uh, with um, in, in kind of sparse settings, camped out at night, um, brought our own power. Sometimes did work by solar power and candlelight. Um, had very little communication with the outside world um, at times, and it, it, those were truly. I look back at that in this in this age of Twitter and you know being all you know connected as those days like almost like I, I miss them. Um, in, in some respects, um, and and it's time you know at times when we're out in the field just to totally shut off. But w but what was really interesting, I would say, and then I'll, I'll I'll pause for the next question was when we were doing this work and, and in the early days, and this is a 30, 30, 35 years ago. I mean, I'd be out in an uninhabited island off the coast of Madagascar, and and you know similar kind of thing. You'd see similar types of scene, a whole field team carrying all sorts of kit and, and stuff to and from a boat and shuttling things with a wheelbarrow and cleaning equipment at night. And just when you got off the boats, that's when the work started. Sometimes, you know, it'd be up till midnight by candlelight in those first field seasons. But what was truly remarkable in terms of that communication message that BB brought and that John highlighted, two years into, three years into doing our first field work off the coast of Madagascar, um, we actually had Discovery Channel come out with us and do one of the first, in essence, live feeds from you know using you know satellite technology and a school, um, uh, an audience of school children here in New York City communicated with me in the field. So you know it was already starting to change you know back in the mid 1990s. Um, and 
I wonder if this is something you can speak to, Fabian, but the, the role, so that's the marine station. Um, also, I mean, your grandfather had an underwater laboratory. Um, so I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about how that like sort of changed research practices um, and why that was useful. So people like BB and Picard and all that were really the beta testers for a lot of platforms to go longer and deeper, such as uh, the bathyscaphe, the bathysphere, and, and many others. These were um, just really amazing pioneers and it allowed into a foray of, of exploration of other types of platforms and technologies. By the time I was a kid on Calypso, it was already version 2.0. Uh, my grandfather had uh, a submarine called the Sukup, which we actually, you saw a couple of days ago over at Metrograph. Uh, and along with that, actually within the, the movie, he had built some of the first underwater habitats from which uh, scuba, or uh, what he called oceanauts, which are now called aquanauts, would live and, uh, and be based from at the bottom of the sea. Now there's a big difference between a, a, a bathysphere, a bathyscaph, or even a sukup, or even a military sub, and an underwater habitat. One has uh, viewports and hatches that you lock, and you keep a one atmosphere uh, inside of air. The other one, you make a big giant hole in it <laughs> at the bottom, and you pressurize it such that you are at ambient pressure at the bottom. And there's an advantage to each one, the, the underwater habitat, the advantage is that because your body acclimates to the pressure, you now uh, are at saturation. You become a, a what one is uh, called an aquanaut after 24 hours of living and working under the sea at pressure depth. And as opposed to a submariner who, once hoisted back on deck, can get out and have a sandwich and, and a glass of wine. Um, unfortunately for us, <laughs> we're not allowed wine at the bottom of the sea, at least depending on the vessel you're on. Um, <laughs> But uh, it does allow for personal access to the bottom and uh, a fairly unlimited bottom time working within that, um, that ecosphere. So if you're working on a coral reef, uh, for example, with Mission 31, which was the, the, the succession to the conch shelf habitats, uh, I took six people to work underwater for 31 days. And we were able to dive 12 hours a day as opposed to from a, a, a boat, which is uh, much more limited. And we didn't, whether there were storms or not, wouldn't matter. Whereas if you're hoisting a submarine out of the water onto a deck, as you could see, wasn't necessarily the easiest thing and quite dangerous in many ways for both the people on deck and the people in the, su uh, the, the submarine or the, or the vessel. As a matter of fact, I heard some stories earlier, I think it was, uh, it was from you that about the <coughs> uh, seasickness within the, the bathosphere. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> um, for those of you who are curious, the, the film to see of uh, Jacques Cousteau living underwater is World Without a Sun. Um, so uh, part of what we're seeing in the films here is BB, uh, at times in the beginning, he was collecting coral specimen and um, taking fish to study. And so Howard, I'm wondering um, how what they were doing fits into conservation practices of the, of the time. Um, yeah. That was, I mean, that was really it. And it's in, in some respects, it's still, it's changed quite a bit, but there's still at least some of these practices that still go on. I mean, in essence, the, these were collecting trips. Um, and, and even, you know, I have colleagues through various institutions, the American Museum of Natural History, the New, you know, the New York Zoological Society, the New York Aquarium. I mean, it was, it was common practice to go out to these, to these remote, faraway places and, you know, bring back specimens for you know, for study to describe to describe species um, to to illustrate to general public to a broader audience, you know what what was you know what were these unique organisms that no one else had access to in the natural world? As as John alluded to, I mean Teddy Roosevelt was you know famous for this, and there are a number of pioneers. BB clearly illustrated here as as one of them. Um, and you know, you know, Constance Carter, you know, being part of that that journey, really being truly remarkable. I mean, nowadays it's really interesting. There's some, there's a still part of our of our field, but uh, with with modern technologies, I mean, I, I've actually been part of actually um, uh, both uh, elevating a new species of whale um, to, as a separate species to science, and um, and describing a new species of dolphin 
to science, all of which, you know, a hundred years ago would have taken place with a collection, either from a whaling vessel or, you know, a stranded animal or in cases where they, you know, might have been a collected animal. Nowadays, we, we do it with a museum specimen and a sample of DNA. I do have a question because I noticed in some of the film, and, and I noticed in some of the film of the World Without Sun as well, back in those days, they would bring up the specimens from the deep, and it seemed like uh, some of them didn't make it. Uh, I, I guess it doesn't really matter when you ultimately put them in formaldehyde, but it was interesting to see that some of the specimens did make it, and they were they were trying to make the move in the in the dishes, and some of them were fairly still. Has have scientific practices advanced so that you can acclimate them to bring them back to the surface? Yeah, nowadays, I mean, all of these submersibles, um, you know, they have pressurized you know systems where they can actually keep these animals under proper pressure at their you know at their atmospheric pressure. So they actually can, you know, use all these deep sea submersibles. And in fact, one of the one of my first internships at the National Undersea Research Program was looking at the needs um, for for science um, and scientists that were doing deep sea research. And you know, clearly, some of this is, you know, access to um, animals, preserving them under their natural conditions. Um, and as you could see, I mean, some of these things, as John pointed out to his opening remarks, people just couldn't believe these things existed, right? You know, um, I mean, it, it was the, these, you know, pardon the expression, these freaky looking fish, right? And it was like, how, how did these, th you know, it was just, it, it was unfathomable at the time. And, and then not to mention with, you know, especially when you brought some of these things up, they didn't either quite make it. Um, and then they, people couldn't see either their colors or the dynamic nature that BB and others experienced when they were at depth. But those are that's changed now with you know with the sort of modern technologies that that are you know that are used in research submersibles around the world. I'm always amazed at these creatures, uh, all the creatures that that scientists like yourself bring up, because they're an inspiration to movies like Alien. Uh, they're also uh, a proof that nature has a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. I mean, it's funny when, you know, I always wonder, and not that, you know, we've done, uh, since I've been working in the field for 30 years, we've done our own sort of um, capturing of images and, you know, how, how fitting to do this here at the Museum of the Moving Image. Um, watching these films, and by not any comparison in any way, shape, or form to William Beebe, I'm a little curious and also scared to see what someone might find a hundred years later when they look at our films, um, starting with what? beta cams to you know high definition video to now we just put a GoPro on the boat and we just let it go. And you know, I, I actually don't look back at that. You know, an archivist, a you know, video archivist at the, at the Wildlife Conservation Society looks at those. And you know, I only see the footage that ends up in, you know, sort of highlight reels and things like that. I wonder also what doesn't make it that's somewhere in the depths of, uh, and I hope maybe, you know, hopefully someone will enjoy it, but I, I guess, you know, I, I guess I won't have the opportunity to wonder or look at that in the Stay future. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm wondering for each of you, uh, maybe what sort of, if you can each maybe say what conservation means to you and what, what maybe if each of you can say what the major conservation challenges you're focused on right now are? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, conservation to me is very simple. Uh, when my grandfather started back in those days and, and in BB's days, it was really uh, adventure exploration and, and, and science in the, um, in the most um, direct of terms. Uh, as he went on uh, filming and inviting scientists on with them and everything else, uh, especially in the late 50s, early 60s, it became it became exploration with a message, with a conservation message. And I grew up with that conservation message that he used to tell us all the time, which is people protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. Uh, and with that, it breeds hope, brings the, the power of the communities to protect and cherish the world around us, because at the end of the day, this is a very unique oasis in space, one that we share with a, a, a countless number of sentient beings, our, our fellow sentient beings. And we're just as dependent on that web of life as, uh, as it is on ours for in terms of impact. You strip away the, the magical part of our planet, which is water. Uh, it's just a lifeless brown rock in space like any other. 
Uh, it's our natural resource bank account. It's it really is a, a, an amazing place and also a very fragile ecosystem that that makes us as a new species on this planet viable. So we really need to figure out that formula so that we can cherish it as such. That was that was terrific, and I'm going to riff off that <laughs> <laughs> because because I don't even that was stated very eloquently and 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 from a broad point of view. So I'm going to riff off that and go to a to a very kind of very specific point of view of what conservation means to me in terms of the organisms that I work in. I primarily work on whales and dolphins around the world. And, and for me, conservation really entails um, protection, you know, continued protection, ensuring the recovery of these iconic species fr to, from depleted states to, you know, to, to where they can flourish in the world's oceans. Um, and it also means in ensuring that that, that continued protection continues for the long haul, so we protect their most important habitats, that humans can benefit and enjoy from these majestic animals. Um, and in some cases, you know, there are other types of benefits, economic benefits, but I won't, I won't in, in essence, from, you know, ecosystem services or whale watching or other types of things that go along with that. Um, I, for m what's really remarkable now, through time, I mean, w we've stopped the large-scale commercial whaling and hunting. There's a moratorium on hunting large whales. But these animals face 21st and 22nd century threats in many of their environments. That comes from oil and gas development. It comes from industrial fishing, depletion of their prey. It comes from climate change. Um, and these are, um, the, the oceans are changing rapidly. Um, very in and dramatically and um, as a conservation biologist you know we have to work with a variety of different stakeholders to address these changes so that we ensure this continued recovery and protection of these animals because they've come a long way from severely de depleted states almost driving many species to extinction you know bringing them back in essence from the brinking of extinction and now they face this 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 range of threats that are you know somewhat unprecedented Okay, so uh, we have time for a few questions, if anybody has them. Let, let, oh, yes. Let me add one thing. Lest you, any one of you, think that you're exempt from this, we are all responsible for being able to protect the oceans, whether we're on the ocean front or not, because every single one of our daily bad decisions, with or without knowledge, uh, has a huge impact on our marine ecosystem. So we need to do things like keep straws out of the ocean and so on and so forth as, as much as we can as individuals and encourage our decision makers to make better choices such as creating larger marine protected areas and such. There are a lot of solutions out there. It's just a matter of that knowledge coming into the hands of, of everyone. Yeah, I think it speaks volumes for you turning out on a, you know, on a, on a glorious Sunday uh, here in New York. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you, you recognize what proportion you are of the entire population, let alone the population of New York here, that, you know, by turning out here, by engaging, by coming to this, you know, event um, that highlights, you know, the, the, the work of William Beebe and the, the, the New York Zoological Society um, here at the, the Museum of the Moving Image, you know, you're, you're already standing up and saying you care about these issues. And I'd say that maybe there's a role for... Uh popularizing science and, and the way that, you know, in Bibi's tradition and Cousteau's tradition, uh, you know, finding a way to make that accessible. Um, yeah, you had a question in the blue, yeah. I think that's probably a question for Maddie Thompson, who, <laughs> um, who certainly deserves a lot of credit, or John Dolan. I think probably one of those two could answer that better than uh, um, than than I think we could. Yeah, um, Maddie is the archivist at the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is headquartered at the Bronx Zoo, and so she's here. And you know, you can speak to her afterwards, and if sh if she has time. And uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, they have 3,000 reels of film, as I mentioned, that they're really just beginning to catalog. What we saw um, was 
digitized maybe in the last 15 years and you see it's you know it's bits and pieces from possibly different reels of film um and yeah it is incredible and i think we're all waiting to see what else is maybe in there <laughs> <laughs> i was asked the other day actually uh by the folks at the academy what i might have in the basement <laughs> so to speak yeah. so there's a uh, there is a hunger for that especially the archival uh footage which can never be duplicated and it is some of the beginning of the the etch the, the visual, if not the audio visual portion of the registration of, of modern science. So it's uh, it's always very educational to see. Yeah, and and, and uh, to a, a, a broad point, I mean, I was speaking a little bit about you know, in tongue in cheek about what those films might look like, you know, from thirty years of cataloging our research. <laughs> but uh, but every once in a while, I come across some of my old field notes, and and it 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 really brings back like you know these you know these really you know, not just heartfelt memories of some of the work that we were doing, you know, out in these remote places, but I kind of think to myself, you know, wow, you know, I, there was something that I see today when I'm out there and whether it's off the coast of New York here studying whales or somewhere else thinking like, you know what, I saw that 25 years ago in Madagascar. And, you know, it, it's something, you trigger something in, in your mind when you look back at this. So there's, there's really great value in this and preserving these types of materials. And in fact, you know, some of the historical whaling records that, as John, John alluded to, the first curator, Charles Townsend um, of the New York Aquarium, I mean, those, those records, those whaling records um, are preserved by the Wildlife Conservation Society and still used in modern research and conservation today. And I'll just minor note, but um, in order to take these films, especially the ones um, that were underwater, they invented their own camera to do it. I mean, they, they used a camera of the time and John T. Van and BB uh, basically built this waterproof brass box um, that was like watertight and they went underwater. So they were, um, it, it was at the start of sort of moving image history that they were making these too. Anyone else? Up, yeah, mid. I think that's for um, you. <laughs> it, it definitely takes a special person uh, to want to do that. Um, you know, we saw some shots of, of BB hard hat diving, and that certainly uh, has its own risks. Uh, going down in an iron ball uh, to, ver to crushing depths uh, has even greater risks. Um, even scuba diving, depending on the parameters, uh, has risks. And it's in each case, you have different sets of, of psychological parameters that one needs to be able to wrangle and, and be ready for. Um, being claustrophobic obviously might be an issue. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the explorer, the adventurer, the scientist um, already is rather odd and crazy. So most of those folks, or many, uh, a, a good <laughs> trench of those folks, uh, already have the gene necessary to use those tools to go deeper, long, and further for I in the quest of, of learning and, uh, and bringing back more knowledge. I mean, just to add on that, I, I would say, you, you know, when, when I was doing a lot of the work in, in Africa, and, I, and now I have, it's, it's, it's evolved. We have, we've trained people. There are people that are based in these countries. And I was going back, I was living in Manhattan at the time, and I would spend three to four months you know, talk about the juxtaposition, right? Living in Manhattan and then going to live on an uninhabited island, you know, off the coast of Madagascar. I'll just stay on that one for a minute. You know, it was just us and the lemurs, in essence, and the whales and dolphins. And it was remarkable. Better but neighbors. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> in, in some respects. But, but the isolation part of it, you know, not communicating with your family or friends. Um, Sometimes, you know, you're the expedition leader. I mean, so you put yourself, you know, look at that film, you know, everyone is looking to you for the answers, right? So you have to have, you have to be fully prepared in any circumstance to deal with anything that might come up. Um, and that whether that's students or staff, I mean, you're the leader, right? So you're in essence out there, you're isolated. And it, so it does take a certain type of persona to, to manage that. And then on top of it, you're also going to some of these faraway countries where you might have you know, you might be out on your own. I mean, I, I, we, I was out on my own at times, you know, where I was the only person that spoke English, and then I had to adapt and learn those languages and adjust to those cultures. 
Um, and so there's an adaptive response to it as well. It's not the same type of obviously being underwater and dealing with that type of experience, but Bibi had to deal with all of those things too when he traveled to, like for example, Haiti. You're still isolated though. Yes, in yeah, a sense. exactly. Maybe one or two more. Yeah, up there. Yes, John. <laughs> so, uh, maybe this is for you. One of the things <laughs> I was struck by, especially by that early footage, is in, in a way it was sort of heartbreaking to see the grief, particularly around Haiti, uh, in such beautiful shape yeah. compared to what you see now. You know, it, it, it's very, very different. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to your own experience with the changes that you've seen in reef, coral reefs over the years, and where you see the conservation. John, why does the hard question have to come from you? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, th I, I and, and you probably know this as well as I do. I mean, the, the reefs um, in general around the world obviously have taken quite a hit over the last few decades. Um, in the last three generations, uh, so even back to, to Bibi's uh, era and, and, and my grandfather's era after that, uh, the reefs were still in fairly, well, per the, the, the movies um, and the statements, the reefs were still in fairly good order, fairly pristine uh, in many ways, other than those where dynamite fish had fished, of course. But um, in the last few decades, uh, we've seen such an acceleration in consumption uh, on many levels, including fossil fuels. Uh, it's created a huge impact on an ecosystem that's very fragile, or especially a, a set of species, coral. Uh, that are very susceptible to variations in temperature, variations in pH, variations in, in, in pollution, uh, runoff, et cetera, et cetera. And all those factors uh, from nearshore development, from all our consumption in our daily lives with regard to uh, burning energy or black energy, um, and just not paying attention has has decimated uh, many of these beautiful coral reefs. I'll give you a, a very simple example. When I was um, not even a teenager, I, I've been diving since my fourth birthday. I know that's a little weird, but um, special <laughs> circumstances. Uh, and uh, I would go to places like the, the Florida Keys, which is uh, reputed for being some fantastic coral reefs or has been for many, many years. And back in the early days when I was a kid, the, the reefs were beautiful. There were fireworks display of life. And uh, I go back nowadays uh, a, few <coughs> a couple decades later. And, uh, you know, the, uh, it's night and day. Uh, uh, as far as m the perspective I have personally, having seen them in the shape they were in, and even in those days in the, let's say, early 70s, uh, they certainly had some impact, although as a preteen I didn't know any different. And they still look beautiful. And now I see them with those eyes. And um, it's a desert wasteland comparatively. Now, if I were to bring my six-year-old to go diving there, she would probably find it fascinating and beautiful and everything else. It's all a matter, of course, of perspective. And that's why these archives are so unbelievably important, so that we have a, a base of knowledge to, to start from and, real and the realization of where we're at to try and change uh, policies, try and change our consumption, try and change our behavior in a way that might be able to bring back those reefs and a lot of that, that biosystem so that our young people can hopefully enjoy what we've taken from them. I just want to add on and build from where Fabian just left off. And it's going to sound like John planted this, but he really didn't because <laughs> I had no idea he was going to ask this question. But, um, uh, you know, one of the major aspects that the Wildlife Conservation Society works on and, you know, are these wildlife and wild places and marine wildlife and important habitats and, and part of those entail coral reefs. And this is the part that gets into the legacy of Bibi, that, that history of science and discovery. Um, in essence, we have a leading coral reef conservation program, which, it, which entails scientists like myself and, and people from their own countries working um, in nine global regions, nine global marine regions around the world, and they, they're using the, you know, and generating some of the most important science to look at reefs that will persist through climate change, that can withstand some of these warming events, that are areas that are important for governments to protect. And there are a whole set of suite of initiatives to, like, in terms of marine protected areas and generating um, larger and, um, marine protected areas that we're engaged in 
to to help you know help these reefs per persist through these great threats and challenges. And then the last part would be is that is if you get out to the New York Aquarium, as John mentioned, you know you will begin when you just walk right in through the doors you will learn at least about several of these global regions and and learn about the the remarkable diversity their importance what they offer to you know the surrounding human communities um and it's right there right as you walk into the aquarium and that's a very good point actually experiential learning uh is of paramount importance especially for those who don't or might not ever get a chance to go diving and see these things for themselves they can go walk into the new york aquarium and experience what uh, it would look like what it feels like, what uh, what amazing creatures there are, so that you can connect with what we're saying here and and really get a, a good chance uh, at understanding why it's so important. Uh, I know th that there are a lot of programs out there that people can get involved in. The uh, I know the Ocean Learning Center has some programs, uh, WCS has programs, uh, and hopefully the culmination of all these different entities and partnerships will allow the general public to be able to come on these journeys, experience what things we're talking about, and then become part of the solution. Okay, we have to finish. Um, but uh, I, I just wanna thank um, Howard and Fabian so much. Uh, thank you to John Dolan. Uh, thank you to High Water for their music. You should be able to remember that name, I hope. Uh, and really thank all of you for coming. Um, yeah, and um, I just wanna mention, uh, please, uh, if you like this and whatever, uh, like st uh, stay tuned to scienceandfilm.org for upcoming science and screen programs. And I'll just mention that the next one will be on April 29th and we'll be screening uh, John Frankenheimer's 1966 film, Seconds, uh, starring Rock, Rock Hudson. It's about a man um, who gets a second chance at life and we'll be talking about the economics of starting over in America. So hope to see you again. Thank you all again for coming. <laughs> <laughs>